Seattle police say new video technology holds officers accountable, but not everyone is smiling for the camera. For us, it's really about building public trust. What happens to all that video? Or the information the city collects about your energy usage or your bill payments? You should be able to have control over that as, as a citizen. Our digital lives are being collected as evidence against us. Hopefully we can alleviate concerns before they start. Thank you for calling. Join us for an interactive town hall as Seattle speaks about the city's new privacy plan and how it could impact you. Welcome to Seattle Speaks at Town Hall. I'm your host, Brian Callen, and tonight we're here to talk about privacy in a very public forum. This is a topic filled with issues, both global and personal. So tonight, we're going to focus on a specific piece of this, a new effort by the city of Seattle to establish a privacy policy believed to be the first of its kind for a city in the U.S. As we discuss this policy, you will notice a common theme here, the struggle, the tension between trying to protect your privacy and trying to have a transparent and open government. So to break apart some of these difficult and complex issues, we have an esteemed panel with us, and I'll introduce them to you right now. We have City Council Member Bruce Harrell. He's the chair of the Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Technology Committee. He has been working to help craft Seattle's privacy policy. We also have Tracy Ann Cosa with us. She's on the board of directors for the Seattle Privacy Coalition, a group we'll be hearing a lot from during the show. The coalition played a big part in shaping the city's privacy principles. We'll be talking about that. We also have Mike Wagers. He is the chief operating officer of the Seattle Police Department, a civilian role there. The SPD very much front and center when it comes to the privacy debate, especially with body-worn cameras. We're going to be touching on that a little bit later. And also we have Narisha Wells. She is chair of the Citizens Telecommunications and Technology Advisory Board, otherwise known as CTAB, a group that, help, that helps guide the digital future of our city. Let's give them all a big round of applause, shall we? All right. Great. And I want, to thank, I want to thank everyone in our audience for being here and being involved in this topic. Thanks also to Town Hall and City Club for making this program happen. So our show runs 75 minutes, and we, of course, will be hearing from our audience here live, but we'll also be hearing from an online audience as well. And to tell us a little bit more about that, our online correspondent, Angela King. Angela, how are you? I'm doing good, Brian. Good to be here. And we are looking forward to a really robust discussion online. And there are a couple of ways you can get involved. We'll show you exactly how right now. So take a look at your screens here. If you would like to actually take the survey and answer the questions, go to our homepage, seattlechannel.org, and this is what you'll see here. So go ahead and click on the Seattle Speaks icon, and you'll be directed to our live feed along with all of the survey questions. Now, if you would prefer to just leave a comment, you can email us at contact at seattlechannel.org. Finally, for all of you on Twitter, just use the Seattle Speaks hashtag to join in on the conversation. And again, we are looking forward to a lively discussion. But for now, Brian, I'll send it back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Angela. I want to tell you a little bit about who is in our audience here at Town Hall this evening. We asked some questions before the cameras started rolling. Looks like most people fall in the 36 plus age range. Good to see that. Some experienced people out here with some thoughts on this. Also, the majority of you live in North and Central Seattle. And finally, most people have an education level of a four year four year degree or above. So we'll see how that impacts our discussion this evening. I'm going to start the evening with a brief opening statement from each of our panel members here. I'd like for you to answer this question. I'm going to load up a good one here and start with you, Bruce, if I could. Should we trust our government with our private information? Bruce Harrell, go ahead. Well, that's sort of a loaded question for me, I suppose. Welcome to the party. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I'll be the politician that says, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that in all seriousness, I would say no. And I, it's not that we have people that would misuse personal information or even be neglectful. But with the advantages of technology right now, uh, it's just very scary what's out there. And so we have to really uh, make sure our policies are really, really strong and we're very competent in what we do. Uh, trust is sort of an interesting term, and so when I look at what we're trying to do now with this discussion and our privacy initiative, um, it's not based on trust. It's, it's based on having the best principles in place and the best technology in place to make sure that we are ensuring uh, that we're putting in place the right safeguards uh, relative to privacy. Fair enough. All right. Tracy Ancosa, your uh, same, uh, same question going to you. Should we trust our government and how it uses our data? 
Well, since Bruce was unpredictable, I will be too okay. and say it depends. Um, mm. I think that your role, your context, and your identity and the relationships you have with government largely will guide the answer to that question. In some roles as a voter, I might be quite comfortable with the government managing my information. In others, mm -hmm. as a potential person of interest to the police, I might not. I see. I see. Uh, Michael, have you weigh on the same idea here? Please. Sure. I mean, you trust government with your data? Do you trust... Uh, private sector with your data. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as uh, <clears throat> I guess on the government side, we certainly have to earn that trust, especially as all this new technology uh, comes about. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say yes, I'm going to say that we'll have to show you how we could earn that trust and make sure we protect the data and protect your privacy as best as possible. Great. Uh, Narisha, same question to you. Okay, I agree with the other panelists, but I would say that from a um, public standpoint, you want to know what the government is doing with that data. And so if you're going to trust them, you need transparency to know where, where they, how they're using it. Okay. All right. Great. I'm going to ask our audience a similar question here that I asked the panel here. We'll start with this first question. This is really the thesis of our show here this evening. How concerned are you about how government, and feel free to include city, state, or federal here, how government uses your personal information? Are you very concerned, somewhat concerned, not concerned? or unsure. And as you consider your answer, we're going to give you some more background about Seattle's effort to establish a privacy policy, the delicate balancing act involved in that. Weighing the need to protect your personal privacy with the need for an open government is an age-old problem that has become a major debate in the 21st century with rapidly changing technology, adding new complications every day. Each trip to work, each business transaction, each keystroke on your computer leaves behind a digital footprint. The question is not if you're being watched. It's how closely you're paying attention to whoever's watching. We have no way of really knowing what's being collected on us and who sees it. Jan Boltman is president of the Seattle Privacy Coalition, a group that formed in 2012 when Seattle police launched a tiny helicopter that turned into a big problem. All the rotors are spinning properly. The Dragonflyer X6 drone, complete with video recording equipment, set off a fierce debate over privacy. The city ended up canceling the program and gave the drones away to Los Angeles police. But a few months later, Seattle police installed a network of 30 video cameras along the waterfront, stirring the debate once again. I love Seattle. I don't want to lose it to a police state where I'm afraid to leave my house. This $5 million camera network, police say, has not been used. Technology has been getting far, far ahead of our democratic institutions. Jan Boltman and the coalition were working to pass some legislation to govern the use, storage, and retention of surveillance video in Seattle when the world turned upside down. June 2013, Edward Snowden's leak of classified information from the National Security Agency showed the NSA's involvement in several global surveillance programs and reaffirmed Boltman's concerns about her city's government. Our digital lives are being collected as evidence against us. With state and national leaders still working to find some answers to the privacy problem, the Seattle City Council to took action. Up. This resolution describes the privacy principles. With help from the ACLU and the Privacy Coalition, the council passed a set of six privacy principles this February to guide how the city collects the information that becomes a public record. They'll provide the ethical framework for dealing with current and future technologies. The principles speak to how the city values your privacy, collects and keeps only the information it needs, and is accountable to protect your personal information. So Seattle really is leading in that we have defined this ethical commitment to the public. Michael Matt Miller is chief technology officer for the city of Seattle. He's overseeing how the privacy principles will be implemented across all city agencies. It's not just police videos he's concerned about. Your parking tickets, bill payments, even your power usage are providing more and more information to a data-driven government that wants to be transparent about what it's doing. Members of the public have the right to request that the city make that data publicly available. Matt Miller is open about the city's need to prevent any further missteps in dealing with privacy concerns. We all heard about the drones that the police department purchased. We heard about license plate readers that were retaining data for an infinite period of time. Those types of issues were not well explained by the city to the public. So over the next few months, the city plans to unveil a privacy toolkit each department can use to answer any questions about privacy in a very public way. By having the right framework in place to make decisions, to communicate to the public when we're going to collect and use their information, 
Um, hopefully we can alleviate concerns before they start. Those concerns are still top of mind for Jan Boltman. She's happy to see the privacy principles in place, but now she wants some action. It's one thing to require compliance with privacy policies, um, but it's an entirely different thing to actually ensure that that happens. It's a challenge the city aims to live up to. Our goal with this project is to build the public's trust in how we collect and use their information. And that information is everywhere if you're truly keeping an eye on those who are keeping an eye on you. All right, so with all that in mind, what are people saying about their privacy? Angela, let's start with you. What are people saying online? Yeah, well, Brian, this question is already creating quite a bit of buzz among our online and home viewers. Lots of folks very concerned about what the government does with our personal data in terms of its use. In fact, 60% of our online audience said they are very concerned about this. Randy just tweeted into us at hashtag Seattle Speak saying, trust government with some, not all personal data. And here's another example. We have this person saying, quote, so-called smart meters collect massive amounts of data in violation of Fourth Amendment rights against illegal search and seizure without a warrant. Furthermore, utilities are selling this data and handing it over to other government agencies. Then we had another viewer tell us they were somewhat concerned because of their insider status, so to speak. She said, having worked for the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division in 1965 through 67, I am aware of how government can misuse information collected on individuals who do not share government leaders' political beliefs and practices. But uh, there were a few viewers who feel indifferent about this issue. This person saying, quote, they have it all already. I give up. But uh, we hope you don't give up. We'd love to hear from you if you would like to chime in on the conversation. Take a look at your screen. We have all the information for you there. To take the survey online, go to seattlechannel.org. You can send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org. And again, use the hashtag Seattle Speaks on Twitter. Back to you, Brian. All right. Thanks a lot, Angela. I want to take a look at some of the poll results from our live audience, who I hope has chimed in by now with some of the details of their thoughts about privacy, their reactions to it. Again, we're talking about how concerned you might be about the connection between your government and your private information here. So a lot of people speaking out about this. Let's make sure we get some of those results coming your way. And maybe we can see a few hands here in the audience. Who has some concerns about how their government is involved with their data? Oh, here we go. Let's look at those numbers. Uh, looks like 32% of you are very concerned. 29% say they are somewhat concerned. 8% say not concerned. Nobody's unsure. That, uh, that's a good sign. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and it looked like a few people are not responding. Who said they were very concerned? Can I see a show of hands out there? Who was very concerned? Sir, uh, would you mind anything you wanted to say about that? Would you mind standing up and telling us your thoughts about it, please? Sure. I think as little as possible, as little information as they need to do their job and nothing more. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I saw another hand back here. Sir, did you want to say something about this? If you wouldn't mind standing up, it helps us with our show. Um, I think government has to have a transactional relationship with citizens, but it, they need to understand that they're at best a caretaker for data. Mm. And if they can't retain it or they don't need to collect, that they shouldn't collect or retain it. Okay, great. Any other thoughts here? I wanted to make sure I talked to this side too, because there are some people who wanted to speak out over here as well. Uh, any thoughts that you wanted to share as we get started here? Sir, if you wouldn't mind, jump up, head out in the aisle here. We'll make sure we, okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm visiting your fine city from another country. Welcome. So it's not my government. Okay. So I'm very concerned. I see. I see. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe, maybe could you tell us, sir, a little bit where you, where you come from and what the policy is where you're from? So I come from the UK. I come from London uh, and England. And the policy is pretty bad there, too. So I'm just as concerned with my own government as okay. with yours. Okay. I would say welcome to America, but I think you got this covered already. Okay. Uh, great. Any other thoughts out there as we start to move on? Ma'am, I'm going to have you stand up, please. I am not concerned simply because I've come to the conclusion after the couple of leaks and stuff that there are no more secrets and we might as well just face that reality and mm. just be nice to each other mm. so that there's no secrets that you have to have. Yeah. But, you know, it, the government has to first realize that there are no secrets and quit mm. doing things that need to be kept secret. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I saw some heads nodding and some heads shaking here. Sir, if you wouldn't mind standing up and head out in the aisle there, we'll be able to hear from you a little bit better. Thank you. Hi. I, my name is Ross. I am concerned about the idea of, of government monetizing uh, the information that they gain from our use of utilities and such. Uh, we don't have a choice about being uh, being part of 
government's uh, constituents. So the idea that they might be using that information to monetize it is of great concern to me. I don't think uh, we sign up for that use, okay. uh, just as we don't with uh, other entities such as Target or others who might want to use our information. Well, actually, at least in the private sector, we often yeah. have to sign off before they use our, our information for their purposes. Okay, great. I, maybe I can, Bruce, let me throw you a question about that, if I may, because I'm thinking about a situation that Ross is talking about here. Let's say that there's a company about, out there that wants to sell a really great light bulb to the city of Seattle, and they're saying, hey, we can sell, sell you this light bulb at a really great deal if you can give us some information about your customers, and we'll see who we can serve there. What sort of third-party access do people have in terms of information from the city of Seattle, that type of data? Well, t to my knowledge, um, that just does not occur, that whenever there's a release of any kind of information, customer usage, customer identity, even assuming that it's sanitized and people cannot see who the actual users were, to my knowledge, I haven't seen those types of requests in the marketing of any services. In fact, um, I would lend. Would, would lead, I, I think that we're pretty conservative in that regard. I would say, and I'll use Michael Matt Miller as, a, as an example. You know, he's our chief technology officer, officer and he has a privacy background. He right. uh, worked for the chief um, privacy officer at a former corporation. So we're pretty in tune to what we have to do whenever we use information. So to my knowledge, we're not doing that. Okay. Uh, Michael, is it a good time to jump in here? I notice you in the front row. Would you mind uh, standing up? Michael Matt Miller is right here. He happens to be CTO of the City of Seattle. We just saw him in our first piece there. With regard to that third-party access to information, can you help uh, build on what Bruce was saying there in terms of what access is available? Sure. We, we recognize that that is a concern of the public, and we share your concern. In our privacy principles, we, we documented our intention to think about those types of issues moving forward in the city. So okay. much like the council member, I, I can't speak definitively to everything that happens in the city today, but as we educate departments, as we look at what we're doing, yeah. that will be something that we, we look for going forward. Okay, work in Thanks. progress. Thank you very much for that. I wanted to get some input from one of our front row guests. Ann Levinson is here. And Ann, good to see you again, and thank you for being here. Ann, of course, a uh, retired judge. She's an independent auditor for the Seattle Police Department's Office of Professional Accountability. So I know we're going to focus on police a little bit later on in our show, but I wanted to talk to you about this with all the different concerns that you have researched about privacy do Seattle's new privacy principles look like a good path going forward it's very difficult to legislate privacy are we on the right path what do you think yes I do, I do think Seattle's doing a great job of trying to lay out the principles and think in advance before any technology is approved that there should be a policy in place and there should be a public interaction about what the trade-offs might be mm -hmm. We all have interests regarding our personal privacy. We all would like open and transparent and accountable government. Mm -hmm. It's finding that sweet spot in each yeah. technology to yeah. protect those individual rights while maximizing the value of technology. Yeah. So to establish principles before we launch a new technology, before a department is authorized to spend any money on a new technology is definitely the right way to go. Okay, and yeah. thank you very much sure. for that. I'm gonna put a finer point on this issue here as we ask our second poll question here. What is most important to you? We're gonna put a list of things on the board here and these items are not exclusive of each other so we're not asking you to uh, hand over your 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 most personal <laughs> thoughts here but I just want you to try to prioritize what's going on here what the list you have in front of you here for the sake of our discussion here in terms of what is most important in terms of personal privacy in terms of public safety government and police accountability taxpayer expense the cost of implementing those privacy measures or something else here you can see those different answers there what is most important to you a personal privacy B public safety C government and police accountability D taxpayer expense E other. So we're talking about priorities here, and I know there were a, a number of different hands out there of people who wanted to get involved in this part of the conversation. As you make your choices, maybe I can ask for a little bit of public input right now. There were some hands back here I thought that I saw uh, with some different priorities back here. Sir, madam, anybody back here that I saw, I saw a hand up earlier. Did you want to jump out real quick and say something? I, I saw your hand earlier. I just want to talk about your priorities with regard to privacy. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, sure. go ahead. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a political activist in my spare time, and I'm an engineer in my day job. Um, and because I'm a political activist, uh, I, and I think my views are often not shared by those in power, uh, I have concern about privacy because, you know, if I can't have, um, you know, if, I, if I'm not in agreement with government policies or actions, uh, I need that privacy to be able to be effective in activism. So your top priority would be your own personal privacy when it comes to this whole debate or the public accountability. That's a that's a tough, tough, tough push there. Well, I, I don't think we have to uh, completely 
eliminate accountability to, to maintain privacy. We have to have both. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Any other thoughts we want to share on this, sir? And could you help out right there and jump in the aisle there, sir? We'll make sure we get your, your viewpoint as well. Thank you very much. That was a very difficult question because uh, not one of those things is mutually exclusive. Fair they enough. all go hand in hand. In fact, when everyone else's personal privacy is respected, my public safety is increased mm. and taxpayer expense is low. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I think all these different things can work together here. And maybe, uh, uh, Mike Wagers, can I draw you in here? Because I know I've talked to you about this before when it comes to the taxpayer expense part of it. The Seattle Police Department has been working so hard on the different public disclosure requests that are out there. It requires so much time, so much effort. Can you quantify that, just how much work goes into trying to answer all those requests? How much that costs uh, in terms of the police department? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Not uh, a little. <clears throat> it's a process where, where we've been continuing to... Uh, refine over the past few months, yeah. uh, but I mean we have 12 dedicated staff that do, they do nothing uh, but go through public disclosure requests mm -hmm. and those requests uh, uh, have increased, they continue to increase and the complexity of those requests increase as well. So I mean that's the, the, the problem that we have or the issue that we have, uh, but we're not sort of uh, going to sit back and try to, we're trying to figure out how to use technology yeah. uh, to solve that problem as well. Uh, which comes with trying to automatically redact the information that we need to redact yep. and then push out the information that we can yep. to, to, you know, that balance, to be transparent yep. uh, so that uh, folks can see uh, what the police department is doing. Thanks for that. Bruce, you had a brief point? Chime in a thought, and that yeah. is, I got to tell you, it's a new day with Mike Wagers and Chief O'Toole, and let me give you a good example. The little snippet we saw on the cameras around West Seattle, mm -hmm. as you may recall, we accepted some port security money, about $4 million, and it was designed just for terrorism around the port. Uh, we asked questions at committee about the use of these cameras, how they would be used, who would access them, et cetera, and it was all concentrated strictly on um, possible terrorist activity around the port. So it looked like a good use of funds. I did not ask the question, do the cameras rotate? Can the cameras be turned and maneuvered toward homes? Okay. We went back and look, looked at the tape. I asked a lot of questions. To my knowledge, up to then, all of our cameras were stationary, so I didn't think to ask that question. Mm -hmm. When we found out they can rotate and be used on personal residences, I was livid as, as, as were the residents, and so we stopped. They have not been turned on. I told the police department, this should not be 20 questions. You know the concerns that we have for privacy. Uh, it's it, the act exact opposite with the new leadership in the police department. Mm -hmm. They understand privacy issues. They are working with us to protect uh, the privacy issues. I'm getting ready to introduce a uh, piece of legislation in about two weeks that will declare privacy as a human right under the Declaration of Human Rights. I think we have to treat it as such, and I'm going to work with the police department to make sure that they incorporate this in all of their policies. But it's certainly a new day in how they're dealing with us on the council. Thank you for that. We're going to be talking a lot more about the police a little bit later in our show. But right now, let's talk about the second poll question we asked. And Angela, let me go to you. What are viewers saying online about this issue, their priorities? Well, Brian, as you mentioned, and as others mentioned, these concerns aren't necessarily exclusive of one another. Some people at home and those joining us online told us they had a hard time picking just one answer. So if that's you, you're not alone. But when it comes to the question, what is most important to you? Our online audience, the majority of them said public safety. That came in number one, followed by personal privacy. And we have one comment or a few comments here. But this first comment, this viewer saying, quote, government and police accountability ties right in with personal privacy. So they're both number one on my list. And we also got this comment. Safety for all means more trust of others and less social pressure toward paranoia. My trust that you will not cause me harm means safety for both of us. If you would like to take the survey, leave a comment or reach us via Twitter. Take a look at your screen. We have all the information there for you and we look forward to sharing your comments here on the show. But for now, Brian, I'll send it back to you. All right, thanks very much, Angela. Let's take a look at what the results are from our live audience here when it comes to the different priorities that everyone is looking at with regard to privacy. I know this was a difficult question. I appreciate everybody playing along here so we can talk about some of the different issues that surround privacy and the difficult, difficult time that we all have in terms of setting those priorities. So let's take a look at those poll results right now as we figure out what our audience is saying about this situation. I know it's a difficult question, but let's go to those results right now, talking about the top priorities that you have for uh, privacy and how that breaks down. Let's see what we have here. Wow, it's really evenly mixed, isn't it? We're talking about personal privacy, 
24% of you said that. Public safety, 20% of you made that a top priority. Government and police accountability. Looks like that's ahead, but would you really call it that with so many different points that have been made here? Taxpayer expense, some concerns about that, some other concerns as well. I'm going to go back to some people in the crowd here in just a moment, but I wanted to talk about something that I did not have on that priority list. And Narisha, I wanted to bring you in here, if I might, and talk about this issue here. I didn't bring up different issues of race and social justice with, and I know you've written extensively about uh, these different issues. I wanted to talk about that and how that intersects with this issue of privacy. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Well, one thing that we can point out is that, you know, in the room, all the people here are over 34, I think it yeah. was. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you know, there's a whole population of people that are not at the table for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so their voices aren't being heard and neither are their concerns. And then um, you have the, you know, we can look at the racial makeup of the room in here. And, um, the ability of the people in the room. And all those things matter when you're talking about using people's information and their privacy concerns. And if they're not at the table, then we're making decisions for them and we don't know their concerns. Okay, very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I uh, wanted to head into the audience here and talk about the different priorities out there. Who said public safety was a top priority? Would someone mind helping, helping me out with that? I saw one hand, a woman who had spoken before. Anybody else talking about public safety? Who's got public safety on their mind? Okay. Hearing crickets out here, folks. Uh, how, about, how about personal privacy? I know this has been a big topic for a lot of people. Who might help us out with the thought about uh, personal privacy? Ma'am, did you have something you wanted to share? Uh, sure. Why don't you stand up and we'll... Yeah, okay, uh, please tell us um, about it. I'll hold the mic, thanks. Oh, thanks, okay. Um, personal privacy is something that I'm really concerned about when it comes to surveillance because I feel like uh, journalists, people in the mental health professions, people that are medical professionals, um, there are relationships that even if you don't think within the government is being as big as it is that you have concerns. There are things that you don't want shared and increasingly we're using more and more technology to communicate. We're messaging instead of calling and we're emailing everything that we think and we feel and all of those things are susceptible to government surveillance. And when we become more dependent on those things to communicate, then I feel like that's a free speech issue too, not just a privacy issue. Okay, thank you very much for that. Any other thoughts from the audience on this? I think there might be a few. Hold one second. Uh, there's a lady that I saw before, Jan Boltman. One more time, would you mind standing up, Jan, just so we can see a little better? Uh, from the Privacy Coalition, your, your thoughts on this. Well, I said that personal privacy was the top priority. And the reason for me is that privacy, uh, I think, is equivalent to dignity and individual sovereignty. Um, I think we talk a lot about privacy in terms of technology and in terms of policy, and of course that's what we're talking about here tonight, but, but there are larger issues um, that make privacy important. It's how we find out who we are as human beings. It's the mental space where we create uh, our philosophies and decide how we want to interact with the world. Um, we have to have privacy in order to think. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, there's a fellow with his hand up over here that I did want to call in. This is Shankar Narayan, the ALC ACLU's legislative director. Shankar, why don't you stand up? I know you had a concern you wanted to, to bring up here. I'd like you to do that. And also, if you wouldn't mind, talk to us about some of the things that are happening down in Olympia. I know there are some laws, uh, some bills, I should say, that have been circulated there. Uh, tell us about your concern and what's happening at the legislature right now, please. Sure, I would be more than happy to do that. Uh, in this discussion about priorities and categories, one thing I wanted to highlight that hasn't come up is the distinction between privacy and government surveillance. I think people would look very differently upon the potential for embarrassing photographs of themselves to leak out into the world. That's a very different thing from one's own government cataloging systematically information about oneself in combination with other similarly innocuously gathered information that eventually could be used against you. The government has a lot of power and that's why I think it's, it's very different from uh, simply concerns about private photographs or things like that that leak out. And perhaps if that had been a category, it might have scored a little, fair bit, enough, fair enough. Okay. A little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, the news from Olympia is mixed. Uh, <clears throat> I think I have some good news, some mixed news, and some uh, not so good news. The good news is that uh, as of this week, the legislature passed a bill on cell site simulators regulating them. It will be the strongest bill in the country. These are the so-called Stingray devices that many of you may have read about in the newspaper that uh, connect to your cell phone and maybe have the capability to actually suck uh, your information, hoover it up, 
uh, without any accountability. We now, hopefully, if the governor signs this bill, will have uh, some of the strongest protections in the country around that. Okay. Uh, you saw on the clip that the legislature is taking a second crack at the drone bill. Uh, that has one step to go that we believe it will uh, pass this week. Uh, it will go to the governor's desk, and we have some indication that he will sign it this time, so that would be very exciting news as well. Uh, on the not-so-good news, the two dueling body cam bills killed each other off. I know we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, they came from very, very different philosophies uh, and different uh, thoughts about what principles should guide uh, what kinds of surveillance we have and also what uh, will actually facilitate police accountability. Okay. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. All right, Shankar, thank you very much for that. Tracy Ann, can I bring you in this conversation? I know that you had some experience beforehand uh, working with the government of Ontario up in Canada. I wanted to do a compare and contrast. I know this is something that's really breaking some new ground mm -hmm. here in Seattle, but tell us about your former experience and uh, maybe what you're bringing to it in terms of this debate here in Seattle. Sure. Um, well, as the other Canadian in the room pointed out, I'm <laughs> sorry to say yeah. that um, <laughs> sorry. The, yeah, we're I a got little you. bit ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I heard yes, that. I three. heard that. Okay. Yep. Um, the Canadian government's had municipal privacy legislation in a variety of provinces for a long time. Ontario is where I was from, and the municipal privacy legislation there is about 30 years old now. Um, and it sought basically to establish a lot of the same principles that we see in the Seattle Principles document for privacy, um, namely focusing on accountability mm -hmm. and the importance of having some kind of independent role and an independent review process for anything that the government wants to implement far and beyond looking just at technology. I, see. Um, I think technology has become an important buzzword in the privacy debate, but there was a privacy debate long before we had networked computers, right. Right. and there will be one long after we have networked computers and after IoT and the Internet of Things has become passe. Okay. Um, and I think that's what the government's job really is, is to okay. look at privacy with that longitudinal view and implement something that acknowledges that individuals have privacy, but governments have none. Okay, fair enough. Uh, as we continue this debate over privacy, we're going to switch gears here a bit and take a look at the agency that interacts perhaps the most directly with people in our city and that's the Seattle Police Department. The SPD has had a checkered history on privacy issues and now the department has started a new controversial program involving body-worn cameras. Now we're going to focus on the SPD as a case study of sorts about the challenges of implementing a new privacy policy in Seattle. And a quick warning here, some of the images that you're about to see are quite graphic. What's your name? Don't worry about my name. What's your name? Seattle police officers say situations like these, where they have to use force, make up less than 5% of the work they do. But often, these encounters make up 100% of the headlines. Put the knife down. Get on the ground. Police have wrestled with privacy issues for many years. Officers record your emergency calls. What's the address, please? Even take pictures of your license plate for parking infractions. But watching people on camera has created a whole new list of questions for Seattle police to answer. Potentially they can look right into our, our houses. As we've shown you, the SPD has had its share of missteps with video technology. Proposed programs for drones as well as waterfront cameras have been scrapped under public pressure. Somebody's going to go to jail. Plus, in 2012, it was found the SPD lost more than 100,000 videos and a court ruled the department was not responding in a timely way to public requests for video evidence. Let's do this. So is it really a good idea for Seattle police to create even more video evidence through body-worn cameras? We feel it's really a moral obligation. Deputy Chief Carmen Best says the research is clear. When police use body cameras, public complaints and uses of force decrease. Get on the ground now. Police in Seattle and other cities nationwide are calling for more body cams after the Ferguson grand jury decision and now a murder charge connected to officers in South Carolina. And because of that, we feel like it's very important that we at least make the attempt to get those body cameras out um, in the field to officers because we want to reduce uh, those incidents. Thus far, Body cams have been issued to 12 officers in Seattle's East Precinct. It's a pilot program that started in December of last year. Police are experimenting with different video systems and how to properly redact or cover up sensitive information like the identity of a juvenile or domestic violence victim. The evaluation wraps up this June. There's no accountability regarding body cameras. Some people have criticized the SPD's use of body cams and the YouTube channel that now displays them in redacted form. 
But the department is getting some support from an unlikely source. I just think this is a really shining example of how the police department is engaging records requesters. Tim Clemens asked for all of the SPD's 1.7 million videos last year. It's a request that is allowed under public records law, but one that takes an overwhelming amount of resources to fulfill. Yet after a recent police-sponsored hackathon, Clemens is now contracting to help the department improve its video evidence system and, as Deputy Chief Best puts it, restore public trust. What I'd really like to see is an open and transparent government where people have confidence in what we're doing and that they're able to look at uh, our interactions but still have the confidence that their privacy rights aren't being violated in any way. Those privacy concerns loom large for Jared Friend. Now, a lot of people, including you know us at the ACLU, believe that privacy is a, a civil right of sorts. Friend, technology and liberty director for the ACLU, helped craft Seattle's new privacy principles. Get out of the way! He believes body cams could be a great tool for public safety, but only under strict guidelines. Without that, right, they're just another video camera that can be exploited for whether it's surveillance purposes or kind of sensational YouTube posting, right? Both those things are really serious concerns. The reaction is more positive from the community than negative. Police say their new system, releasing body cam video on YouTube with heavy redaction, is working. Those who want more detail can make a request at a specific point in the video. It's a subtle but important change. Currently, public requests for video evidence can generate massive media files that have to be reviewed second by second to make sure sensitive information is not made public. We have actually a unit that's dedicated full time to reviewing reports, video, documents before anything is released. But changing how the public accesses video evidence is a delicate subject. And we want to be really careful not to limit our public records law. The ACLU is pushing police to remain transparent, but still respectful of the privacy of the people officers are dealing with. It's a complicated issue that has even the city's community police commission asking for more time and public comment before body cams are implemented citywide. It actually is a really really difficult juggling act to think through um, how do we go about balancing our goal for an open government, our goal for public accountability with these privacy concerns. And there's no one size fits all answer to this. Why am I under arrest? So how will a new privacy policy affect police? The answer is still as unclear as the faces you're seeing on YouTube. The hope is with more public input and improving technology, a solution will come into focus. All right, so let's see what you think. Our third poll question of this evening. Do you support the use of police body cameras? Simple question here, and I'm hoping to get some input from everybody on this one. This is a very, very hot topic in Seattle and around the country and the world for that matter. Yes is A, B is no, C is you're unsure. Uh, Bruce, can I bring you in at this point? Because I wanted to make sure I brought in this idea of the recent update you had from the Seattle Police Department about what's happening with the body cams. Your thoughts about that and what you heard. Well, welcome to my world. Yeah. Trying to balance the need to protect privacy and still introduce technology that hopefully can um, change behavior. That, that's the balance. Uh, I support body cameras for a variety of reasons, and we're trying to find that sweet spot to how to still protect the, the privacy interests. We have a trial going on. I think we have, uh, I think, good news, and that is the officers are comfortable. It's, it's worn comfortably. Um, they see people are be, behaving somewhat professionally toward them. There's so much data out there. There's a study in Rialto, California, that they look at the amounts of complaints against officers being dropped, the amounts of violence used by officers being reduced significantly, de-escalation being more the norm. And so, so again, we're, we're, we're seeing that what's trending here in Seattle is much like what's happening in Rialto, California, and I hope that that continues. Okay, Mike, can I draw you in here too? I know you just had this report that came out from the SPD about how these body cams are being, uh, what people in the public are seeing about it. Can you briefly tell us a little bit about that report, what we're seeing thus far with this pilot program? Well, we, we don't have any uh, <clears throat> feedback from the public yet. We asked okay. the uh, Community Police Commission at the conclusion of the uh, pilot program right. uh, to uh, conduct surveys, focus groups, to get citizen input. We certainly collect input from our officers on a weekly basis. Okay. Uh, and we also collect a variety of other data to evaluate uh, how the system's working. Yeah. A lot of us trying to develop the functional and technical requirements now, okay. uh, should the chief, mayor, and council decide to move forward with full deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, and this is why we're here, yeah. uh, most of our effort right now is trying to figure out the redaction piece. I mean, yeah. what do we do with all the video right now uh, that, that we are collecting? And that's the reason we uh, uh, are trying 
uh, the YouTube channel out and the overblurring of the faces on our uh, on our body cams because it's such a limited amount of data currently versus going to our in-car video. Got it. Okay. And I want uh, Bruce quickly. Yeah. To, one quick point. When Walter Scott was tragically murdered in South Carolina, and it was a murder in my opinion, and we saw a, a piece of it, we would not even know who he was had it not been for someone hiding behind a fence and putting that on, on camera. Mm. What we are seeing now is an ugly chapter in our country. This is not new facts that are occurring. These kinds of incidents have been occurring. And so again, while we work out the perfection in privacy politics, I have to capture that just so that the country could see what is happening to many groups of people and we can change that behavior. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Angela, I wanted to go to you and talk about what our online audience is saying about this question, their, their answers to it. Yeah, Brian, as you said, this is a hot button issue in general and online. Lots of our online audience, in fact, 57% say yes, they do support using body cameras on the police officers, citing several recent high profile cases we've seen across the country. Now, we just got this message in from Ted online. He said, quote, I think it's a great idea, protects us and the police. So Ted sharing the same opinion as another viewer who wrote in to say, quote, yes, I support police body cameras as they tend to support the police and show the circumstances around the use of deadly force. But not everybody is buying that logic. We just got this comment as well. This person saying, I am hopeful body cameras would add to officer accountability, but I worry about the use of the recordings for non-police accountability purposes. Electronic data can be hard to control. Others saying body cameras alone aren't enough to create accountability, which ties into this comment. This viewer saying flat out no, arguing, quote, the city needs to focus on high standards of police behavior and training and weeding out the bad apples. If that is done, then there is no need for body cameras. Now, if you would like to chime in on the conversation, you can log on to our website, seattlechannel.org. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org. And if you're on Twitter, just go ahead and use the hashtag Seattle Speaks. And that's what Samantha just did. We got this message in from her on Twitter. She says, if the expenses involved with surveillance are so high and results so low, why the push to continue other than control? So that's the response from our online audience. I'll send it back over to you now, Brian. All right, we'll see what's happening with our live audience results in just a second. But I want to talk about some of these surveillance ideas here. And Mariana Kornstrom, maybe I can bring you up. Can you stand up for just one second? Sure. Mariana, I've, I've talked with you a number of times before. You work with the Southeast Seattle Crime Prevention uh, Group down there. I, I know that you have actually been calling for cameras for years, actually more surveillance in Othello Park. Tell me about that effort. Why do you want more cameras out there, more surveillance in as many different places as you can? Well, the thing was we were having a huge amounts of crime. And it's a park that's kind of isolated. Mm -hmm. There are lots of pockets that don't lend themselves to passive surveillance. And um, so we, and we couldn't place an officer there all the time. And the crimes that were occurring there were pretty heinous. Mm -hmm. So um, we thought that we needed the cameras in order to help with our public safety. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it, because sometimes it's groups that are doing this and continue to come back because it's their turf. Yeah. Um, now the interesting thing is that there's been a lot of programs being put in the parks during the summer. Right. And we now have an apartment building mm -hmm. next to the park which is really cut down. I think we've only had two incidences hmm. lately in the park. So okay. that's also really good. Yeah. I, I think about some uh, neighborhoods, uh, Capitol Hill, for example. I remember a few years ago, Cal Anderson Park, they put up some cameras there. I think it was around 2008 or so. People weren't crazy about that. They didn't like that. They said, take them down. They ended up doing that by the year 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it just seemed like a tale of two neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods really want these cameras and some, some don't. And I'm talking about surveillance cameras that are That's, mounted and yeah. so forth. Uh, your, your thoughts about that? There's a lot of different opinions well, here. Well, my big thing is it depends on how much effort. A, it, a public safety is paramount to a community. And if you don't have that public safety piece and we're understaffed as far as the police department goes. Mm -hmm. So if we want to try and get a hold of that problem, mm -hmm. those cameras don't have to be active mm -hmm. years and years and years. Yeah. You take care of the problem and then they can be shut off. And I am, I'm pretty sure that the ones in Cal Anderson Park 
were activated mm -hmm. and then but they're still there but they're not active right I know there's a lot of cameras around the city so like that it, a quick question to you though yeah. it sounds like body cams is something that you would definitely support am yes. I right on that okay great we're gonna hear from a lot more people in our audience here let's see what our live audience is saying here with regard to those numbers uh, what are people saying about body cams here in the city of Seattle used by our Seattle Police Department those numbers well it looks like a lot of people are saying oh yes I support the use of body cams in Seattle, six out of 10 of you believe, yeah, that's what we have right there. Uh, the no crowd, about 8%, unsure, about 13%. Uh, let's see who's in the who's in the no crowd here. Who's who has a concern about body cams? Don't want to see them used more often. Can I see a hand out there? I'd like to hear some people talk about this, sir. And would you mind stepping in? Thank you very much. Uh, jump out in the aisle, and uh, Anne can help you out. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if a lot of people are aware, but Chicago is one of the highest used camera cities in America. They're pole-mounted cameras. They have over 10,000 of them. The report was just done, a massive report. It just found that they're completely ineffective at reducing crime. So you should just know that. I don't know about body cameras. That might be different. But one of the things about surveillance cameras that's not really, police work best when they can solve crimes and prevent crimes. But body cameras at best are going to be reactive. They're not going to necessarily prevent a crime. I do, I'm aware of, Ms. of Councilman Harrell's report that he's talked about where it does actually has reduced violence on both sides. But people should understand that cameras are a reactive tool. They're not necessarily preventive. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, maybe I can draw on a, a, I'm going to draw on you in a second, but there's a fellow I noticed. He has a distinctive look to him, Tim Clemens. Would you mind jumping up for a second? Uh, Tim, you were in our setup piece there. I just happened to notice you in the audience before the show started here. Uh, let me know about uh, something that I think has changed for you. You're actually now working for the Seattle Police Department. Uh, I know not too long ago you were asking them for all the records they had. What, what changed there? You're, you're part of a, a different, I guess, a part of the solution, I suppose, with this now, and I wanted to talk about that change for you. Uh, you simply can't get 1.6 million videos with the current system. The only way to get them is by working with the department. Okay. And so. your work involves what right now? What are you working on? It's really coming up with uh, ways to sanitize the records. So right now, the what you saw, the pouring all the frames, taking out the sound, what that does is um, provide a preview. So um, with body cameras, uh, there are a lot of recordings of social contacts where there's no um, record of that interaction in the dispatch system. And uh, when I was looking at an overboard video, I noticed that two people were pushing each other. And I really couldn't understand why the police officers didn't stop it. I mean, they're right there. And so I wanted to know what happened. And um, so I requested the full video and understood that it was a very uh, volatile situation that could have very easily um, ended very poorly. Um, and. and you would not have known that had we not had this boring. So. Uh, let me ask one last question. What do you hope to do through your work with the Seattle Police Department? What do you hope comes out of it? You know, I, I think it's all about the community really being able to um, be a part of the policing. I, I don't want to see it be a police versus the community. I think if we can somehow integrate where the community um, knows what's going on and can feed information back and forth. Um, okay. All right, fair enough. Tim, thanks very much. Shankar Narayan from the ACLU, I know you had a point you wanted to make. Uh, please share it. Yeah, I did. Uh, and the point really is about, uh, uh, you know, do you support body cams or not being sort of a trick question, mm -hmm. right? In I'm, some I'm really ways, good at those. Yeah. I, I can mm -hmm. tell. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, it really depends on the scheme that you implement yeah. around the body cameras, right? I think body cameras can be a powerful tool of accountability. Of course, I think your, your viewer hit it on the head that it's certainly not the panacea for all issues of police yeah. accountability, but they can be a tool. They will not become so by themselves. What needs to happen is a scheme that uh, privileges police accountability yeah. really uh, uh, goes to who controls the camera, right? If the officer can turn it on and off at will, then the officer is still telling the story. They're, they're just telling it through a, a, a video. Mm -hmm. uh, and who releases the videos, right? If law enforcement has control over that, that also undermines potentially the police accountability value. Okay. And finally, you know, in, in Olympia, the bills we've had have allowed, uh, at least one bill allowed for the use of uh, body cameras as an instrument of prosecution. I see. So to be able to prosecute crimes unrelated to the interaction with the officer. To me, it's not 
clear what the difference between that and simply mounting cameras on street corners and prosecuting people on the basis of their recorded behavior might be. So that's, that's one thing. I think the second thing is the process is very important. There's nothing more important, particularly for communities of color, that in whose name some of these bills are being advanced right. and yet who aren't necessarily always at the table. Mm. You know, if, if uh, for example, complaints go down, which they do seem to at least initially be indicated to go down, we need to understand why. Yeah. If it's because uh, officer behavior is better, that's great. Okay. If it's because people are afraid to interact with the police because they don't want to be recorded, mm. that actually actively undermines uh, a principle of how you achieve police accountability, which is community police relations okay. and community policing. Thank you very much for that, Shankar. Narisha, can I head back to you? I wanted to talk a little bit about what CTAB is doing with this issue, uh, the types of uh, uh, topics you're talking about when your group is, is discussing privacy and specifically body cams. What are your concerns about, what, what are CTAB's concerns about this too? Well, I think that just overall, the privacy conversation, our goal is to help the city make policies that make sense for um, all parties at, involved. So um, making sure that you know there's a system in place that no matter what the topic is, um, we specifically deal with technology. And so um, making sure that you know we're looking at are all the parties um, they're gonna, that are going to be affected by the policy um, included in the conversation. So especially with the body cams, you know, that's something that communities of color are disproportionately <laughs> represented in that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, they're highly policed. Um, and so we want to make sure that when we're talking about those things, you know, are their concerns addressed? Do we know, you know, how they feel about having, you know, the balance of safety and, and having the information out there? Because everyone wants public safety, um, but we don't want to live in a police state. And so we're just always trying to be careful with how we balance that conversation um, to set policies that will make sense. Okay. make sense for that population. Okay. Mike, can I draw on you again with regard to the situation? Because I know there are some police departments out there, Polsbo uh, sticks mm -hmm. out in my mind there, that have said, you know, there are so many issues with this, we're not even going to do it with body mm -hmm. cams, just with regard to the, all the information that comes in, the cost, the public records requests, or whatever mm -hmm. else. Why are body cams so important for the SPD? Why is it so important to you to see a program like this continue? Sure. Well, <clears throat> as the chief has said, uh, uh, if the research continues to hold in terms of changing that interaction between an officer on the street and a citizen, use of force, citizen complaints down, uh, then we have a moral obligation to figure out uh, how to make it work. Mm -hmm. So putting aside sort of the cost benefit of the cameras and the storage and everything else, mm -hmm. uh, if, 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 you, if, you're, if you're about transparency, that increases public trust. If it's about getting uh, at police accountability, uh, if it's also about getting to the truth of an encounter, yeah. uh, then we, uh, we have a moral obligation to push ahead and figure out these issues. And that's what we've tried to do with, with the police department. Yeah. And I agree that in, in many of the comments that, right, you, cameras are not going to solve the problem if you have a huge disconnect between a uh, police department and, and, and a community and communities of color, mm -hmm. right? So unfortunately, uh, the department is under a consent decree. Well, it's fortunate though, we have a roadmap. Yeah. So all these other issues from training to uh, recruitment to training uh, to bias free train uh, bias free training mm -hmm. uh, use of force policies I mean those are our, that stuff's already in motion right so you're layering those cameras on top of that uh, and adding that piece of accountability there that's different from a department that uh, maybe uh, has its own issues that it needs to work through. Sure, fair enough. And Levinson, can I draw you in here real sure. quick? Because I wanted to talk about, just dovetail on what Mike was saying with regard to this Department of Justice consent decree. Clearly something the Seattle Police Department's concerned about. Uh, they need to make sure they answer a few different federal questions here with regard to the use of force. I look at this, I look at the body cams, and I hear what Mike's saying there, but then at the same time, we've got our pl community police commission saying, hold on. We're going to go through this this whole process here, but we want to really hit the pause button. Was the headline in the Seattle Times there? Were you surprised by that decision from the commission there? And I just wanted to get your overall take on how body cams affect this whole federal decree situation. Well, where the community police commission was coming from is similar to the comment you just heard about that we need to engage the community uh, in this discussion about how body cameras will be used and understand that it's not a monolithic community that particularly for communities who have felt the presence of police more as an occupying force rather than as a caretaking force. Um, the presence of body cameras in their homes, in their places of worship, in their business may have privacy implications that a lot of folks are not aware of. So the Community Police Commission was looking to have some additional uh, community discussion as these body cams were being piloted. 
so that people would understand this in our state, our state law with regard to public disclosure is a lot broader than other states. Right. So there isn't a generalized right to privacy. People don't really understand that about our state law. In order to withhold a video, uh, one has to meet a very high bar. Uh, it has to be highly offensive and have no public value. And as those who advocate for complete and uh, distribution of these videos say, um, they, what they will argue that no video meets that test. Yeah. So I think where the Community Police Commission was trying to go is to make sure that those whose lives will be impacted by that, when these are uploaded, although the blurring is helpful in terms of perhaps minimizing the requests and saving the money of production, the State Public Records Act still requires the unblurred uh, video to be released if it doesn't meet that bar. Yeah. And so the individual whose privacy is impacted is the one who has to go into court to argue. First, he or she has to know that there's a video that's been requested yeah. and there's no obligation to notify them. Mm -hmm. And then they have to have the financial and legal wherewithal to go into court to try to make an argument. And then if they do, they have to meet that bar. Sure. So there are all sorts of potential unintended consequences. At the same time, all of those who are interested in a reform and police accountability are very supportive of this technology as a tool, but only if it's used with policies that, as was said earlier, do not give officers discretion as to when to turn it on and off. Okay and only if the policy speaks to what happens when you enter an individual's home where there's an expectation of privacy. Okay. A lot still ahead with that and fountain of information. I appreciate that. Sir, would you mind standing up? You had a point you wanted to make here. Yes. One more time. There he goes. <laughs> you know, I got you. All right. There he is. You. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. The you result, were saying. The result of privacy. Apparently, Seattle has implemented a bill and in the co normal course of things that will get passed on and become a law. All right. Now, when people break that law, now that's kind of a iffy thing, yeah. but when they break it, there must be accountability. When people break the law, they must pay some sort of penalty, not a slap on the wrist. Now I have no idea to what extent this privacy bill could be, yeah. but if it goes through all of this and they set up parameters and somebody abuses those parameters, mm -hmm. there has to be a consequence. All right, great point. Uh, why don't you have a seat there and maybe, Mike, could I bounce that question to you real quick with regard to enforcing privacy laws? I, I know it's a difficult one we and we're, we're not there yet. We can turn I know, over right? Else. <laughs> Got plenty to enforce over here. Uh, tell me about that process, though, just with regard to trying to enforce those laws. I, how, how do you start to do that? What's the process that you look at for that? I, I have no idea, Brian. Okay, no, okay. In terms of enforcing privacy laws, yeah. I, I just know one thing that we pay millions of dollars out more for withholding information the police department does as council member harrell knows yeah. than we do giving out too much information I okay uh, but I, I don't know if michael matt miller and the privacy idt they've been talking about uh, how to enforce these privacy policies once you put them in place sure uh, it might be more appropriate i want to michael. start with you and, and michael it'd be great to hear from you would you mind uh helping us out with this idea of enforcing privacy laws it's a it's a tricky subject. I wanted your thoughts on that, please. Well, and I appreciate the comment. One of the uh, commitments we make in our privacy principles is that we are accountable to the rules that we make. And um, we are still working through what that means. The privacy principles were passed by the council in March, and we've committed by August to put together a privacy toolkit, which will drive awareness of our privacy practices in the city and help departments make the right privacy decisions. One of the things that we are looking to the community to help us answer is what are the right um, accountability mechanisms? How do we demonstrate that we're complying with our principles? How do we measure when departments are perhaps needing some adjustment? So a couple of things that we're thinking about um, is number one, working with our privacy action committee that will be meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in okay. City Hall for anyone who would like to observe. Okay. And we're going to ask a field of experts from academia, from the law community, from the advocacy community, and corporations, how they think about answering that question. Okay. And we'll take that guidance to develop our program. Okay, thanks very much. I believe we have one of those academics with us here. Ryan Kahlo, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for helping me dovetail into that. Ryan, would you mind standing up? Sure. Uh, yeah. Works with the UW. That's what the purple sweater is all about here. Of course. Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing to try to help the city uh, figure out a little bit more about its privacy laws. Uh, tell us the research you're doing and how it could help inform what the city's working on moving forward here. Well, the city, to its, I think, credit, um, invited in a group of researchers from the University of Washington to take a look at how it was sharing data. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we really took a close look. I mean, we did everything from doing focus groups with citizens, with employees of the city. We had interviews with uh, advocates. 
um, with industry. Uh, we did a technical assessment of data that had already been released to see if maybe it could cause some problems that people were worried about. Uh, we tried to get a sense of all the stakeholders' hopes and fears. We even looked at, for instance, all the vendor agreements, or, 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 or we picked a, a bunch of critical vendor agreements. Because, mm -hmm. of course, a city can't do everything itself in-house. So it, like you and I, has to rely on outside vendors in order to process information, to share it, uh, to store it, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we took a look at those terms and everything else. Um, and so we're still processing those findings, but we think it is among the first really kind of comprehensive roll up your sleeves um, uh, examination of open government yeah. uh, with an eye towards privacy and security. And you know, it was made possible because Seattle was in fact quite open about what yeah. it was doing. Uh, tell me though, just uh, maybe if you could touch on this issue, any recommendations you would have for the city of Seattle moving forward and trying to implement something like this? So we're gonna publish a, a paper with uh, the Berkeley Technology Law Journal, which is a, a part of a group that actually funded this research. Yeah. Um, and that will lay out a more comprehensive recommendation. So I, I hesitate to speak on behalf of the team. I, I can tell you a couple little things. Maybe though. in general. Yeah. yeah, in general. So um, you know, one thing that gets lost and hasn't come up in this discussion yet is the fact that unlike you or I or anyone in this room really, um, the, uh, the municipal government, a city like Seattle, is a market maker. Mm -hmm. In other words, it is a huge customer. And so it has the ability to go to its vendors and say, if you want to work with us, if you want to get all this business, you need to, you know, you need to behave very, very well. You need to come up with the standards that we've laid out for ourselves. So I can, I'm pretty sure that one of our recommendations will be um, make sure that you have a, a standard set of agreements so that if you go, if you work with somebody else, mm -hmm. they're protecting that data, they're holding it confidential, and so forth. So it's that sort of thing that we intend to recommend. Okay. Thanks very much. Sure. Sounds like the privacy toolkit might be one way to do that. I wanted to make sure I got any more comments out there on body cams. I know we had a few different things. Was there a point you wanted to make, sir? Uh, maybe Maybe I can come over your way. Pardon me. Okay, so I have three thoughts on body cams. First of all, the technology to extract data from video is really good and it's getting better all the time. So even if this video is perfectly redacted for today, maybe in five years, that video, which is still going to be floating around because once you put it online, it's permanently there. Maybe someone can get some useful information out of that that we do not want them to have. Hmm. Okay. So, so my second problem is. Uh, with body cams, we understand here that it is a solution to the problem that's down the road of how police are behaving. But if we are successful, some people might take that as if we can do body cams, that will fix our solution. So let's do body cams and that will be it. So that's uh, one boy. And, and the last boy is how effective is it for the amount of money we're putting in? Because I, I, assuming it works, there still might be some other programs you could do that are more effective for the money we put in. So just effective is not enough. It has to be cost effective. Okay. All right. Still a, a work in progress, I'll point out there. So I know this is something still the Seattle Police Department is studying. Uh, let's draw on another comment here, if you wouldn't mind jumping in, Matt. I think body cameras can be really useful. Um, we, the police are not policing themselves. Uh, very well. And so the better that the public can provide oversight of the police, uh, the better off we're all going to be. But, uh, but I have concerns. Um, they should be used for accountability. They should not be used as another dragnet surveillance device. Much like license plate scanners can be used to find stolen cars, but can also be used to track where vehicles b have been seen and go back in history and find out where presumed innocent people's cars were, body cameras could be used to go back and find out where people's faces were seen. This is ultimately a matter of trust. The police have lost our trust, and so we're going to put cameras on them. But then we're going to trust them to turn them on and off. Mm. If you can turn off your camera to take a personal phone call or to use the restroom, you can turn off your camera to beat someone in an alley. Mm. Okay. We're Fair going to have to be really careful with these. Fair enough. I yeah. want to make sure that we're aware of that. Uh, Bruce Harrell, let me call on you a little bit here, if I might, because I know this whole issue of surveillance is something the council has been studying very closely here. There are concerns uh, December, January of last year that maybe some police officers were recording some peaceful protests, things of that nature. Help me with that whole surveillance concept there, what the city would like to see out of its police department with regard to these concerns. Well, first of all, to my friends in the Privacy Coalition, we must recall what happened in our city a few years ago that someone was tragically beat in an alley and he suffered brain damage in the millions of dollars. He will no longer be the same, permanent brain damage. Mm -hmm. And there were no cameras on, there were no body cameras or nothing. The officer lied under oath, a King County Sheriff officer lied under oath. It was because there was a camera blocks away and the, the officer said that he had 
put his head against a brick wall. It was because there was a camera blocks away that we were able to see that the officer used his forearm and pushed the person, thus causing the damage. Mm. I'm not suggesting it is a panacea, but I am suggesting that it is the best evidence we have out there. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we're protecting rights, but I will tell you that we are getting real results from what we are capturing. So I don't know if I'm answering the question directly, but I could, I could advocate. Body cameras are one-fifth the cost of digital and car video. The car videos, which only cover the hood of the car, uh, cost around 5000 Body cameras are down less than around $900 or so. So it's actually a more effective tool. Again, uh, you know, the ACLU makes a very interesting point. It's one we sort of uh, talked about for years now about the inadvertent use. I'm for drawing the, uh, some very um, uh, stringent protocols. And if they walk in someone's house and someone says, cut the cameras off, cameras have to go off. Mm -hmm. uh, giving people consent, always um, laying on the side of of uh, protecting rights. But I'll tell you who, who do not like cameras. Um, people selling crack to youth kids, they don't like cameras, okay? People who are driving in stolen cars, they don't like cameras either. And so there are some evil stuff out there that if it, we can get a tool and put the right safeguards in place, I'm trying to protect all of our children and all of our uh, community members. And so I, I get the privacy. I, again, I'm gonna introduce legislation and call it a a, a human right, I believe it's, it's sacred, but again, there's some bad stuff out there, and the first thing we ask, if there's a bomb outside, Boston is a good example, the first thing they do is, where are the cameras, what do we capture, and you know in, in London there's cameras everywhere. Our yeah. expectation of privacy, I will tell you, with technology now, should change. When we yeah. walk outside the street down a couple of blocks, we are on no less than four or five cameras. Yeah. Bruce, I appreciate you making that point. We're getting close to the end of our show here, folks, and I'm going to ask the same question we asked at the top of our program here with regard to your concerns about this. How concerned are you about how government uses your personal information? A, very concerned. B, somewhat concerned. D, not concerned. Uh, excuse me. C, not concerned. Or D, unsure here. Um, I'm wondering if anybody, as you're voting here, if anybody's changed their mind on this issue. We've gone through a lot of different information here. I'm seeing some heads that are shaking no. I'm seeing some heads that are maybe shaking yes. Any, any different thoughts out there over the course of the show here? People's minds are pretty set on this. Did you have a point you wanted to share, ma'am? Well, um, actually there were several things, but one of the main concerns I have is that we can see through the history of COINTELPRO and um, NSA that what the laws say and what the agencies do are not necessarily the same thing. Mm. And one of the, we talk about accountability and transparency all evening, and it's always been from the point of view of what information is gonna be shared with the public. But I think that more what we, what we need to know is we need to know what information that's being gathered is being shared with what other agencies. Mm. And I think it's really important that we track that and that we know who has our data. I want to know who's got my face in their database. Okay. Thank and you I want to be able to get that personally. Excellent. Tracy Ann Cosa, let me bring you in here because I know the Privacy Coalition has been very concerned about this. Is this a situation where your group acts like a watchdog of sorts with regard to the city going forward implementing this privacy uh, policy here? Uh, your thoughts on what your group is going to do, your concerns about this going forward? Um, yes, I'd say we're a friendly watchdog. Um, okay. It's been uh, kudos to the city for inviting us to the table and participating in the discussion. Yep. But that said, we still have a number of concerns. And I think coming out of this conversation this evening, even more so perhaps, um, mm -hmm. you know, to the police department's credit, they reference research and their notions of using body cameras, but research is only as good as the data that's available and we know there isn't data available yeah. to the ACLU's point body cameras are a tool uh, surveillance is surveillance. I mean, body cameras are a really sexy way of talking about surveillance, but ultimately it's still my face on a video footage that's being stored forever. And to Tim's point, being kept forever and five years from now will be easily able to be viewed by anyone. So if anything, I think we're probably more concerned now that the town hall is over than we were okay. in the beginning right. of the evening. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I've changed my mind. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Well, that's okay. It's okay to change your mind. That's what the show is all about. And Angela, let me ask you what the online audience is saying here about this whole situation. Are there more concerns out there among the online audience about uh, privacy? Well, Brian, when we started our discussion, 60% of our viewers at home, online, and abroad said they were very concerned about how the government uses their personal information. Well, it looks like some of those folks online, as well as here, have changed their minds a little bit. 
49% now saying they're very concerned about this issue. And when it comes to privacy, Brian just sent us this tweet saying, rereading the privacy principles, I wish they were more resident-centric rather than city-centric. Also, this comment just coming in from Bethan saying, hope they can define the difference between public data laws and privacy obligations. They don't need to be in conflict. And we also received this comment as well. This viewer saying, you can take a look at your screen. We have the comment here for you. They say there are a huge array of privacy issues from so-called smart meters to the mesh network to cell phone capture towers to license plate readers and much more. The city would be well served to start thinking about these issues from a privacy and civil rights perspective first, not just from the public safety perspective. So we want to thank all the members of our online audience for their participation and comments. And by the way, the discussion is still going on on Twitter at hashtag Seattle Speaks. Also online, we just got this comment from Jenny saying people are making valid points about the loss of personal privacy. While I agree with them, I still believe public safety should be first and foremost. So feel free to go to our website, seattlechannel.org. You can take a look at some of the comments there. We have much more on this coming up on our website. But for now, Brian, I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Angel. Last chance to dance here, folks. Let's get some uh, different comments in here. Uh, why don't you jump out? I'll help you out here. Come on out here, ma'am. Your thoughts? I'll, I'll hold the mic. Go ahead. Okay. On the one hand, um, I'm very encouraged by a civil discourse mm -hmm. such as this, and, and I'm pleasantly surprised at how thorough, and some of the policing plans that were revealed in the newspaper today that showed uh, a broader perspective and compassion right. and getting at the root of problems. On the other hand, my friend Margaret over here made the, the statement that what, what is often portrayed and what is actually done mm -hmm. often are disparate. And I note that in, in spite of the fact M Mr. Harrell indicates that th they're hard at work devising a privacy uh, policy, they also, the city council voted unanimously for smart utility meters in spite of huge amounts of, of information that were given to them about the hackability, about the privacy issues, and that's only one issue. There's about 12 of them okay. with these. And I wanted to also point out that when, when this question was asked from the, yeah. the top IT officer of the ACLU, mm -hmm. Chris Sequoyan and Jeremy Friend, who's the local correspondent or counterpart, mm -hmm. they both uh, answered that smart meters are extremely dangerous to privacy, extremely hackable, okay. and, and it contradicts the statements here about concern for privacy unless that's rectified. Thank, Thank you. you. A brief comment here. I'm going to have to sure. keep it to about 20 I, seconds or so if I, you could, I'm please. I'm usually pretty fast unless I fall down. Don't do that. Um, right. In support of the body cameras, I would say that a child being corrected in public is going to be treated way different than a child being corrected in his own home, so yeah. I support the body cameras. Also, I would like to hear more from Nurash, Nur Nurisha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. On all of the um, racial and even the economic inequalities and variances and how that affects their choice on the survey that would have been up there. I wish, I wish we had enough time for Nurse to get into all of that. And folks, I wanted to give some closing statements, or maybe we should get some more comments from the public here. Let's give it a shot. All right. Sir, uh, go right ahead. Okay? I'm going to take the mic. Go ahead. Uh, Brian, my major concern, that's an underlying concern, it might sound a little old-fashioned to all of this, is, is this getting us further and further away from the principles of the U.S. Constitution? Mm -hmm. We're becoming a post-constitutional society. And that, that deeply concerns me. Okay, all right. Uh, last comments here. Keep them short, please. Will do. Uh, London is a very poor example for surveillance, and those four cameras that might watch any of you walking down in the street tonight are four too many. Okay, fair enough. Last comment here. Uh, jump on in there. Terrific T-shirt, by the way. Ann, why don't you pick that up? Yeah. <laughs> oh. As concerned or ambivalent as I may be, I have great faith in the Seattle process okay. and the fact that that may protect us more than those folks in Washington who invented the Patriot Act. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Some differing opinions to close out our show. I couldn't have closed it any better way. Folks, I wanted to thank all of our panelists here. Can we give them a big round of applause for helping us out here this evening? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thanks also to a great audience here at Town Hall and a great audience online as well. Thanks, of course, to Town Hall and City Club for making this event happen. Head to seattlechannel.org slash Seattle Speaks for more information on this topic. Thanks finally to a great crew from the Seattle Channel for making another terrific show happen here. I'm Brian Callanan. This is Seattle Speaks, and Seattle has spoken. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Brian. All right.